Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, everybody. We did it's, it. I know we did it. We did oh it. <laughs> we did it. You did Eden, it. How come you're in twice? Eden's got a iPad. Oh. Yes, I have an iPad to show iPad stuff on. Eden. Oh, you going, are awesome. awesome. Yes, this is going to be so awesome. So thank you everybody for being here with me. My name is Laura Samarance. Y'all know me. Um, this is Eden, my beautiful, wonderful assistant. Eden goes Yay. by day she. Mm -hmm. And Eden is going to be using Procreate throughout this course. And um, I am not Procreate literate. I am like just hit the surface, the shallow surface of Procreate. But um, Eden, yes, Eden's got um, the Procreate app on the iPad. And we are going to be, um, Eden's basically going to be like, um, what translating? <laughs> what, yeah, what you do. I'll let everybody, you know, tell you the closest equivalent that Procreate can do because Procreate is a very powerful tool, and it's only getting powerful every single year. It, it always updates, so it may not be able to do everything Photoshop can do quite yet, but pretty dang close. Pretty yeah. Dang close. Yes. So thank you all for being here. Um, I want to introduce everyone to. Mira Reisberg. Mira Reisberg is one of our guest speakers. Uh, she is also the uh, co uh, the co founder or the uh, director of the Children's Book Academy. Many of you already know her because some of you have been taking her courses. Um, some of you have um, been in with me with the open studio session. She is a dedicated member, and um, she is uh, a classmate with you. So um, she is um, my fairy godmother. She has basically helped me to really get to where I am uh, a great deal. And I'm so thankful that she's here. She is a wonderful, gifted human being. She's just a gem of a human being. And she's going to be, um, you know, alongside me learning with you and also providing feedback um, to you throughout this course, because she's got a world of experience in publishing. So Mira, say hello. <laughs> G'day, mates. <laughs> I'm an Aussie expat, hoping to move back to Australia next year and um, helping people make one. Oh, I'm seeing some of my students here. It's so exciting. Uh, Kevin, hasn't his work come a long way? It's so exciting. And Mark, uh, Marie was a wonderful part of our graphic novel course. And Anita, you did beautiful work. Um, yeah, I, this is my passion. I tend to kill myself. I've got something extraordinary coming up in August, which is the Kid Lit, the 2022 Kid Lit Palooza, which is our scholarship fundraiser. And we've got some scholarship winners here. So I hope you'll help out with that. Um, and it's just going to be a beautiful thing. Wonderful. Thank you, Mira. Yes. So um, for those of you who have um, registered for the course, thank you so much um, for investing in yourselves in the process of doing so. You've also helped me to uplift uh, other students um, and artists. Um, so I was able to offer uh, full scholarships um, to some students here and partial scholarships to some as well. So thank you all for being here, for being dedicated to joining me in improving your craft. And I'm, I'm here to um, give you as much feedback, wisdom, and of my past experience as possible. Um, and I'm really excited to be doing this course after kind of taking a a little bit of a leave of absence from doing um, the OC Art Studios course. I've had a lot of things going on in my life um, and I'm just kind of getting back into it. So um, I want to, before we begin, I just want to say that some of you, like you're all coming to this course with various experiences. Like um, I have a very um, talented and gifted young student joining me. Um, and um, some of you have, you know, experienced a lot of life and um, have, you know, families and, you know, 
kids and grandkids. So there is a very big range of student abilities in this class. Um, and I'm excited for all of you to um, compare yourself to your past self rather than to other students in the course, okay? So that's really important that you are looking at others and seeing their work and being inspired by it, but not judging yourself along the lines of where you are in comparison to other people. You need to be looking at your gains and where you've come and in fact, in the next six weeks, you're going to be learning so much information that I hope that you see a huge leap in your abilities and capabilities and um, in your creativity, in what you feel that you're capable of accomplishing and just knowing that um, and having the tools available to you to create without the limitations that you've had thus far. And that's basically what it is to be an artist is just, you know, we are constantly coming up with ideas and creating, but um, what I've always found in my years of teaching and maybe Mary, you've experienced this too, is that the, the most creative students are the most frustrated students because there is a gap between their vision in their mind and what they are capable of accomplishing. And so that frustration is a real place that exists in um, the artist's mind and it is a natural thing. And I want you to just know that that is something that's a part of the creative process, especially as you know inventive imaginative people like yourself you're going to have all of this world swirling in your head and it's it's going there's going to be some kind of a disconnect between what you envision and what you can actually create so we're going to hope to you know um narrow that uh, space yes thank you between narrow the that. idea and the execution yeah. And there are all sorts of tips and tricks that you can do that make that happen. Uh, those of you that are in the open studios with Larissa have probably seen how extraordinary it is the ways that she can simplify or complexify things depending on what's needed. Yeah. Thank you, Mira. And, you know, and I know my work has definitely improved and it's, it's, so exciting <laughs> <laughs> yes it is so um thank you so much um so i want to um ask eden to kind of take um take a poll here and I'm, you're gonna i'm gonna ask you some questions um and if you could react by using your reaction down below on your zoom you just like go to your little hand there and like raise your hand so um I want to get to know where y'all are at, what programs you're using, um, so that I can kind of better assist you all in this um, in this journey. So first off, um, if you're using more than one program, that's fine. You can just answer as often as as you um, want. So first off, is I want to know. Um, please raise your hand if you are going to be learning um, and using Photoshop. Okay. Yeah, I already know a whole bunch, but right. know more, of course. Yeah, that's okay. And if you if you know already a lot about Photoshop, that's great. That's fine. Um, okay. So Mira, Anita, and Ciara, and Chloe, you're using Photoshop now too. I think so. Yeah. Oh, that's so exciting. <laughs> okay, I'm so glad you're here, Chloe. By the way, Chloe is my young student. You guys. She yeah. is a very talented and gifted um, web comic artist. Um, and um, yes, I'm excited that she's here. Okay, so we had like three, what, four people? Okay. Um, who among you will be using Clip Studio Paint? <laughs> yes, and if you're using more than one, that's fine too. Okay. Ariana, Tani, so glad you're here. Lori, hello, thank you for being here. Mira and Anita too, okay, great. All right, who among you will be using Procreate? All the hands come up, <laughs> that's all the hands. So that's telling you something, Larissa. I know, that I need to go get an iPad, yeah. 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 <laughs> that's why Eden's here. Yeah, and we got a free course in that for you at the Academy. Oh. 
Okay. You're also going to be learning about it here, so you may not need my yeah, yeah. free course for you. Thank you. Okay. Lots of people using Procreate. Fantastic. Well, I'm so glad that that good to know that um, Eden is here for that. Okay. So um, now on, a, let's say, on a scale of... Um, I don't know if I should do a scale of one to five. Let's do, um, well, obviously you're all here to learn something, but I do wanna know how adept you feel already with um, the program that you're using. So let's say you um, on a scale, no, not, I don't wanna do scale. Let's say um, beginner, um, very beginner, yeah, let's say very beginner. Okay, so who here feels they're like a very, very beginner in digital painting? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Beginner, mostly beginner. But with Clip Studio, I'm just- Yeah, and that can be with board. anything. It doesn't have to be like, if you're, okay. Across the board, yeah. Yeah, across the board. Okay, intermediate. Okay, great. Yeah, you all have, you're all comfortable with using it, obviously. Okay. All right, who feels like they should be teaching this class? <laughs> I always ask that. <laughs> that <was good. laughs> Sarah, you feel like you should be teaching this class? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so great. That's great to know. So y'all are comfortable enough to get yourself in, in, into trouble, basically. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You're comfortable enough to get started and then work and paint yourself into a corner, so to speak. Yes. yes. Thank you. Yes. Mark. Yes. Okay. Well, been there, done that. I'm going to do what I can to help you kind of move forward in, in that so you can figure out um, how to... First of all, if you paint yourself in the corner, what tool you used to paint yourself into that corner and then what, um, how to get out of that. Um, I learned painting, digital painting just on my own for years. Um, I actually was trying to get, um, I was trying to, to get one of my, my, my students to teach me um, and I was willing to pay him any price to get him to teach me, but he was too busy. So I had just learned on my own, but, um, and, and you could do that too. And you probably have done a lot of that. So I guess in this course, what it's not just going to be digital painting, but it's going to be about illustration and it's going to about, it's going to be about style and it's going to be about creating really um, more compelling narrative illustrations, um, whether you're wanting to do that for your portfolio or for your own picture book um, um, projects. Um, and understanding more about lighting and rendering and color and composition and just all those things in this like fire hose uh, summer intensive six week course. So but theory and practice. Yes, in theory and practice. And so and practicalities. In, yeah. Yes. And so there's going to be a lot of, there's going to be a lot of exercises that you can do. And then the first week, um, I did want to mention that um, like this week is going to be just about kind of talking about just the, the tools, a little bit more about how you can explore the use of those tools a little bit more intentionally. So we're going to be talking about style. And style is a very funny thing. And I also have um, joining me tomorrow morning, uh, uh, Chantel and Berg and Thorne. They are from South Africa, so they won't be able to join us at this, this time. So because like this time is like, what, three in the morning, two in the morning for them yeah. or something. So they're going to be joining us tomorrow. So I invite you if you are available. I definitely invite you to join um, the, the class tomorrow morning um, from 10 a.m. to 10.45. They're gonna be talking about the, um, their processes and how they've worked as artists together. Um, they've done numerous books um, for the educational market and that also um, trade. for their own trade and, um, and publishing stuff too. So, um, and they've worked digitally, they've worked traditionally, and they've worked in both Photoshop and, the, uh, and Clip Studio. They're and, amazing. Um, they yeah. are amazing. And they are truly amazing. And they've, so, they've really got it down, how to be efficient. Mm -hmm. And I think um, 
learning the kinds of things that they have to teach is going to be incredibly helpful for anyone that wants to pursue a professional career doing illustration work because they know how to save time and how to make it a lot less stressful because you know where things are and how to you know take shortcuts yeah and we talked about that when I spoke with them the other day and I um they they do we will be talking about that definitely um ways that you can use actions in both photoshop and in clip studio paint to create shortcuts so that if you're doing things um in a repeated fashion that you can um, create a more seamless workflow and that's definitely something that i want to be able to share with you guys too is is how to create actions to improve your workflow um, okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go um, share my screen and I'm going to um, first, I'm just going to cover just some basics, some real basics. Um, you probably already know it, but I want to make sure I cover cover my bases. And um, first off, I'm going to go, let's see, let's go to share my screen. And what program is starting? And I'm going to look, I'm opening up both. Okay. Oh, okay, so let's see here. I've got Photoshop and I got Clip Studio. Okay, so I'll kind of be going back and forth um, really quick. And just, just so you know, um, the basics. Um, when you're creating, when you're first creating, um, obviously you wanna have a canvas. And the thing that I always wanna make sure that people know, because sometimes people don't know, is that when you create a canvas that um, the resolution of your image is really important. And um, the DPI stands for dots per inch. And the higher the resolution of the DPI, the dots per inch, the more detail that you'll get. Often if you're creating something like a web comic or something that you're just going to be sharing on um, the on your computer or on your phone, you can get away with using a lower DPI or dots branch. U144 is, um, these are your kind of um, default um, or your standard choices here in Clip Studio Paint. And um, I always wanna do this just at, at the beginning, just so people can see the difference um, because sometimes people aren't aware of that. And um, also one, one of the things about Clip Studio Paint that I love is that it is um, it, it doesn't use as much processing as say Photoshop does. But um, when you draw in um, a lower dots per inch, um, you're gonna you're gonna notice the resolution is a, is a lot. It's more pixelated. You know, like eight bit. Eight bit is like there's literally only eight pixels per inch, and that's why it looks so square. So the lower the number of pixels per inch, the more the more pixelated your image is going to look. And so I've drawn this at seventy two dots per inches. And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna actually go into um, um, edit. I'm gonna change the image resolution. And I'm going to increase the pixels per inch to, um, I'll double it to 300. And when I double it to 300, what that's doing, it's not really changing the size of the canvas. It's just adding more pixels in there. And when it adds more pixels, it's going to create it so that um, I'm going to be able to um, get even um, a more, more um, uh, detailed work. Okay. And if I go in and you can see how um, now when I lower, my um, brush stroke, you can see that when I draw here, it's a lot smoother compared to the edges here. And I'm zooming out a lot and you can see the difference. And that's the same thing that happens in Photoshop too. If I were to switch over to Photoshop and create new, um, and then you'll have this orientation there. Um, you can create the pixels per inch. Um, and so typically if you're gonna be working in creating digital imagery and you're planning on printing it, then I would always recommend at least 300 pixels per inch. Um, oftentimes I'll even go a little bit higher, maybe 350, um, because that way you can um, really get a lot of detail in your work and um, it just, it makes it a lot nicer. Okay, and so um, obviously if you're in Photoshop and you have your background here, you can't use that. You don't wanna use that first background. It's always locked 
So I always just go to a new layer and then I'll draw in here. And you can see how I'm using a pencil right now. It's really, it's, it's really detailed. Another thing that I would recommend too is if you are using Photoshop or Clip Studio Paint, um, I'm not sure, Eden, you can tell me if they does this on Procreate, but um, what I like to have on my edges of my canvas is the ruler. And you can see the rulers are set here in inches and on Clip Studio Paint, I have that as well. It doesn't have the numbers, but um, why I like to have the ruler is um, in my windows is so that I can see how far I've zoomed in. So I can see there's a little notation here and a little notation up at the top of the screen, that's one inch. And if I'm zooming in this much, and I also will set my navigator on the side so that I can see where I'm at at all times, um, I can see how far I've zoomed in. One thing that I will say, um, that I've also learned in um, creating digital art is that um, you can you can set your um, pixels per inch at a lower rate in the beginning stages of your artwork, and this is something that I I've I learned along the way. Um, when I set my artwork to, and I'll do a new one, I'll set, um, I'll create a new image um, and I'm gonna create the aspect ratio 11 by eight, which is fine. And I'm just gonna go to 72 dots per inch right here. I'm actually gonna, yeah, I'll keep it like this. Okay. So um, what we'll be doing is we'll kind of be creating thumbnails um, and ideations of your sketches. Um, and um, thumbnail drawings are basically just what you sound like thumbnails. They're small drawings where you sketch out your ideas of your illustration or your um, comic or whatever beforehand. And you do it kind of small so that when you are planning things out, um, you're not working too much in the detail. You're working with larger shapes. About composition. Yeah, and you're, thank you, thank you. You're really focusing on the composition. So um, when you have your thumbnails, you've got them side by side. You have a whole bunch. Um, and really well, when you're, when you're working really small, say that again, Mira. I was saying that when you're working with thumbnails, if you're doing a book, say, mm -hmm. um, when you've got the thumbnails, you can see them all lined up together. Yeah. And you can see where you need to zoom in, where you need to zoom out, mm -hmm. where the composition is too similar from page to page or spread to spread, right. how to have more variety, how to, you know, have profiles if images are too similar. Right. You wanna you want every spread to be a surprise. Yeah. That's but great. That's connected. exactly true. Yeah. So when you when you do thumbnails and you're creating a thumbnails for a dummy like in uh, Mira's course, the children's book academy on um, the the business and of um, illustrating and business. writing. Yes, yeah. the craft and business of illustrating and writing children's books. Um, in that course, we would um, do thumbnails. And um, when you do your thumbnails for your entire book dummy, you can see them all out, you know, um, really, really quickly. Um, in this instance, what I've talked about when you're doing thumbnails, it's when you're drawing thumbnails, um, digitally, you, you can create your illustration to have um, a lower pixels per inch. And that way, when you zoom in, you're not, you see how pixelated it gets. You're not yeah. really able to, um, to get too much detail or you try not to get too much detail. And then what I usually do, and I've done this with all the Disney artwork that I've been working on is um, I'll, do, I'll do my sketches in a lower dots per inch. And then um, I'll go back into um, when I'm ready to do full detail. And usually what it, it looks is something like this. It's usually, um, let me do this. Let me get rid of all of this. All right, let me do this, okay. Delete. Okay, um, I'm gonna use this little thing here, which is the inverting the selected area in Clip Studio Paint. And in Photoshop, that's just Command or Control Shift I. And then I'm gonna delete all of that other stuff because I just want this. And usually what I will do is I'll have a little drawing like this. And then um, I will take my thumbnail and I will do Control T and I will make sure that I zoom it out so that it fits 
um, the aspect ratio, or whatever I'm doing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and crop this image. I can use on Clip Studio Paint if I just use my selection tool and I click and drag over there. In this bar down here is the crop, and so I can crop this out. And now that has the correct aspect ratio. Now what I can do is come in here and um, I can go into edit and I'm gonna change the image resolution. And now it's, I'm gonna up the, the DPI to 350. And when I do that, it's still the same aspect ratio, but now you can see how pixelated my drawing was. And now when I use my brush in here, you'll see, whoops, how I can get some really nice smooth lines in here that they won't be as pixelated. But this is a good way to kind of get started in your compositions, use lower DPI, but then you have to remember that when you move on to the next stage, and we'll talk about this later, that you just increase the, the, the um, pixels. But I don't see the advantage of using a lower DPI. Oh, well, for me, I just, um, let's see, like if you wanted to um, do some color sketches. Um, and you wanted to do color oh, sketches and, and a do lower quick and, quick and dirty. Yes, quick and dirty. That's the by keeping it a lower dot per inch, it's forcing you to keep it loose and quick and dirty. It won't allow you to get super too refined. Dirty. Yes, okay. it won't Good. allow you to get too refined. That's just a tip. You don't have to do it that way. If you want to start off with your high resolution all the way, that's fine. I've um, you may forget to increase the DPI. So that's always something you, you know, you might do and you'll, you know, go all the way to the end and go, oh shoot, why is my artwork so fuzzy? And then you'll realize that you created the whole thing on a low pixel um, and that's not good. So if that's something you think you might do, then <laughs> you don't have to do that. Um, Eden, is there appropriate equivalent? Yeah, I was gonna say, I can, I can show you some of the equivalents. There's one thing that you showed that Procreate hasn't quite gotten to yet. They have mm -hmm. something similar, but I will explain that when we get there. Okay, yeah, go ahead. I've allowed you to stop sharing. See so if you wanna share your screen, you can do okay, that. Okay, let's do this. Share content. Only the host can share okay. this. Oh, will you remake me a co-host? My iPad lo logged oh, out. Oh yeah, 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 okay. So right. love, you can share your iPad on this. Yeah, I just log in with a separate account, but there's also a really, excellent app called Reflector that I'll probably be using next time. Um, and Reflector will actually show you where I'm pressing on the screen, which is nice. Okay, you should have the ability now. Screen. Okay, just about to come up, start broadcast. Beautiful. So we are looking at my iPad screen. I am in Procreate. It's a little bit, it's going to be a little bit laggy next uh, week. Won't be like that because I will have the reflector. But that being said, so you have your Procreate up here, obviously on the plus, you're going to create your canvas. Now I have a bunch of messy canvases, but let's just start with the 10 by seven and a half. So if you look in the top left corner, you are going to see the wrench. You're going to want to click on the wrench. You have canvas and you have crop and resize. It'll take you there. And then when you hit settings, that's going to tell you exactly what your resolution is and how large your camp our canvas is, which I really appreciate. So DPI, I have it at 300. And like Larissa said, you could change it as much as you want. But what that's going to do is also change how many layers you have. So now I can work with 75 layers and you can see that at the top because I have such a low 100 DPI. But of course, the more DPI I add, if I go back to 300, oh, I still have 75 layers. Isn't that oh, nice? Awesome. That means Procreate still works. Yeah, let's, let's do it to 600. Let's see how many layers that changes me. Still yeah. 75. Wow, look wow. how strong Procreate is. So a very big advantage. One thing to know though, Procreate, I have an older iPad. So I have an iPad from about 2018, I believe. Ooh. And if you make a big enough file, it can crash your um, iPad. 
That being said, it typically does not lose too much stuff because Procreate saves as you draw, which is really nice in comparison yeah. to Photoshop. You have to always make sure that you're saving. So typically if something does crash on me, like when I'm working on one of my comics and I have a lot of layers going on, it might crash, but I don't lose too much. Which Eden, is nice. Eden, can I jump in here? Absolutely. Um, you're lovely. Um, my iPad died this year. Oh, rest in peace um, and I could not get my procreate docs back because I couldn't figure out because they save it it mm -hmm. doesn't automatically save to the cloud or anywhere like that mm, and that so is excellent to know back up your images save them on the cloud get in the habit of doing that because you can lose them permanently that's awful that it is was awful. It was really awful. And yeah. I also lost all my main computer, my iMac stuff this year as well. Oh my gosh, Mira. I'm so I know sorry. that is horrible. <laughs> but that is that is excellent advice um, to make sure you're saving it to the cloud. Or the nice thing about Procreate is you can actually save PSD files, which are Photoshop files, and you can open Photoshop files on Procreate, which is ex like amazing. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So the one thing that Larissa showed that Procreate at this moment does not have, but again, they're slowly improving it, um, is the nice ruler function you had. Um, it has aspects like that and that it will have snapping and you do have drawing guides. They're not as precise and mathematical as Photoshop. So if you look at my screen, you in your wrench, you'll see drawing guides. So you can turn drawing guides on. Right now you have a grid. If you go in to edit your drawing guide, you can do a couple of different things. Right now I have it on a 2D grid. So when I say it's not as refined, I mean, I can't say I want each of these grids to be, you know, one inch. Ah. It's kind of just a uh, loosey goosey yep. slider. Oh, well, I guess it has the pixels. It actually does have the pixels. So you could look up how many pixels in ratio to your um, canvas, but yeah, so you have the grid size is a little loosey goosey, but you can change it by pixels. And actually, look at that. They updated that and bam, they updated it even more. You can actually add inches. So everything I said was a lie. I can say <laughs> I want a one inch box. And there you go. I love where did you get that? So, where did I get that again? The drawing guide is going to be up in your wrench. Yeah. Which is going to be in the top left corner. No, You're going to have the inches thing. Oh, perfect. Okay. So let's draw a drawing guide, edit drawing guide. Let's say I'm doing the 2D grid. Now look down where it says grid, where the sliding toggle is. See where that number is changing? Uh huh. You can actually click on that number and you can change it millimeters, centimeters, inches, pixels. Beautiful. And then can you input the, the amount that you want? Yep, you go, you click on yeah. the length. Yep, say I want 12 inch, well, yeah, or 12 You're inch pixels. pixels. If I want one inch, oop, too many one inch. There's that. Let's say I want 0.5. It can do that as well. Awesome. So that's awesome. I didn't even know that they really updated it in that way. You can also change the opacity of your grid, which is really nice if you want it really thin. So it doesn't, you know, clog up your visual space. You can also change the thickness, which kind of is like the opacity in a way. So they have isometric perspective, now, perspective is a little bit of a beast in itself on Procreate. We can talk about that when we get a little bit closer to perspective. Yeah. Um, I'll probably make a whole separate video because the perspective in uh, the iPads probably update updated since I used it. And it's okay. a little finicky like that 2D program, but it can still work. I've made incredible cutouts entirely on Procreate. You also have symmetry, um, which is nice and... So say my symmetry right in the middle, you can move this bar wherever you want the symmetry to go on your drawing. And you can move it up and down, over up. It's really wonderful. Can you alter the angle of it? Yes, you can. Okay. So canvas, edit my drawing guide. You just have do to- a little, Do a little drawing, yeah. Oh, have it yeah. on a, well, it's like a green yep. note and Okay, so note. now draw something. I shall. And you can change the color of your line too. I just changed it to white. So now I'm going to change it to like a blue. Okay. So it's important if you actually want, so say we have our symmetry line 
Let me make that much darker still. Thickness, yeah. opacity. There we go. Let's put it in the middle, roughly. And do it on an angle. That's going to be so much more interesting. Okay. <laughs> no, no the ruler. Yeah, the ruler <laughs> on the angle. Okay. No, okay. Because we all know about symmetry on a face and, you know, or building or whatever. Okay. So in order to actually make the drawing guide um, work, so for instance, symmetry, you have to make sure your layer is on assisted. You can't just have unassisted. How you do that is you click your layer and it will say drawing assist right now. I have a check mark on it, which means it will work. So I'm going to uncheck it and show you what I mean. I can just draw whatever I want and it's not being symmetrical like it should be. Yeah. So let's clear that. Let's use this pretty orange color. I don't actually like this pen very much. Um, so now I'm going to click drawing assist. So let's say I want to draw, I don't know, an eyeball or something. Now it's working on an angle. Oh, this is so cool. So that's beautiful that you have the option to turn it on and off. <laughs> yep. And this works with your 2D grid, your perspective grid, which is a real game changer. Mm -hmm. Um. And yeah, just anything that that drawing guide is very strong. I often use the grid myself to make sure I have a good composition and that everything Beautiful. is working out there. And edit drawing guide. I think and, that was sorry, about where, where does symmetry live? Where does symmetry live in that drawing or in that? Yes, drawing guide. So in the wrench. OK, yep, you have to turn on drawing guide right there again Got next week when I have reflector it's actually going to show you where I'm tapping on the iPad which will be a lot more helpful oh okay good cool oh so here's the drawing grid make sure you toggle that on then you go to edit drawing and then everything you should need will be on this bottom bar 2d isometric perspective symmetry and all of your little fun sliders down here. Yeah, and of, of course, you can turn on drawing assist while you're in this uh, window, but you can always turn on drawing assist by tapping your layer and checking it or unchecking it. Oh, awesome. And as we go in the course, I'll explain all these other little tabs when you click on your layer, what those ones mean as well. Yes, we will get to that. And I'll make a resource folder actually where I just show step-by-step -step with like circling, like this is where you find this. Um, Cause I know a lot of it can be, it can be a lot of information all at once and having those quick guides can help. Yeah, thank you, Eden. Yeah. Mark, you have a question? I do. Eden, is the drawing guide in the layer? If I've drawn, I've clicked on drawing guide, but the edit, where was that in the layer? Um, when you say yeah. the edit, Just do that. Um, when you get all this stuff here at the bottom. Oh, so that, that from? you have to go to, and again, I'll do a step by step and I'll, okay. I'll put it up today. You click on your little wrench up here in the corner. Yes. Once you click on your wrench, you have to toggle on drawing guide. Yes. So now my toggle's on. Then you yes. click edit drawing guide. Oh, edit drawing guide is below it. Yep. Edit I drawing guide. And then it brings up that beautiful bar. Got it. Thank you. You are so welcome. Oh, my God. I oh, know. It's, so much. It, it's mind blowing. When I slowly started I finding it. out just how to use Procreate, it can level up your yeah. game very, very quickly. And it's so beautiful and portable. Yeah. And it's just as strong as Photoshop in a lot of ways. And it, again, only improves every year. Beautiful. So, Thank you so much. You I'm are so, so welcome to share that. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Who's learned something new already so far? Raise your hand. <laughs> Yay, <laughs> we're, we're on the right track then. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna switch gears and I'm gonna talk a little bit about style. Okay, it's 3.40, so we end at five. Um, so basically, um, as digital artists, we have this amazing 
access to infinite possibilities in our digital paint programs. And um, that is both a wonderful thing and a curse because having the infinite number of colors and infinite tools at our beck and call or at a disposal, um, this has come like somehow we may, you know, paint ourselves in a corner or we might get, you know, be exploring in ways that we're not, you know, um, familiar with. And so, um, we're gonna we're gonna talk about how, as artists, you can kind of really intentionally um, choose the, the the medium that you want and um, and explore that in different ways. So, first off, um, talking a little bit about style, um, my my experience with this and where I came up with um, my thoughts on this is basically just from my experience as both an art educator and an animation artist who has had to, um, has had to intentionally draw in a specific way to match stylistic aesthetics on um, a, working in an animation pipeline. And so it's because of that, those two things um, that I've developed this, you know, philosophy on style. And um, so, yeah, we'll just kind of talk to you about that. Let me jump into um, that. Go in here. Okay. Format slide, slideshow. So, Oh, I have to probably go here first. Okay, let's go share screen. Okay. All righty. Slide, show, slideshow. There we go. Okay. Ah, <laughs> uh, let's see here. Now I can't see anybody. Okay, there I can see people now. Okay. All right, so this is our first week. Just gonna talk a little bit about style. Okay, and um, I've thrown these slides together. I wanna thank Mira for um, some of the imagery that I'm using in here. Mira worked as um, an educator as well for a very long time and put some of the images that I'm using in here. And they're um, dated, they're dated. And they're dated, <laughs> okay, so I, 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 You know, I have some shame around them. Oh. The books that I did a long, long time ago and some of them are really dated. Um, and I will update them one day, but this this isn't the time. Okay, yeah, it's all right because uh, what you what you had was really helpful for what I'm going to be talking about today. So, um, so what is an artistic style? So um, I'm just going to read this. Art styles describe the way the artwork looks right it's basically the manner which an artist portrays his or her subject matter and how the artist expresses his or her vision style is determined by the characteristics that describe the artwork such as the way the artist employs form color and composition just to name a few and an art style or artistic style is one which clearly represents distinctive visual attributes okay the distinctive visual attributes are the things that we're going to be talking about today, okay? And that those, those attributes can be linked to a particular artist or period. So a stylistic thing can be like an individual style or, you know, a style um, of a period of work. Um, so you're familiar with like, you know, the impressionists and the abstract um, artists, cubism, um, you know, uh, classical, like the, that kind of, that's a broader reaching style. So we're going to talk about more along the lines of like your own individual artistic style. Um, an artist with a particular style will have a collection of artworks that have a common theme or certain qualities that determines the artist's style of art making. Okay, so that's kind of an, an just an introduction to what style is. But um, what I figured out is basically style is just a matter of choice. And it's the choices that you make. Okay. And at every step of the way. It's the first choice is your choice of medium. What are you using? You're using digital tools or you're using traditional tools, great. Um, even within the tr digital tools, um, you have choices in terms of what brushes you're going to use. If you're gonna be using brushes that emulate traditional 
um, mediums like oil painting, watercolor, um, charcoal, ink, things like that. So that's your first choice that you make in terms of your stylistic aesthetics. And we all have this unique place. We have this unique, um, sorry, unique um, uh, things that we like. And it's in, we make these choices based on our likes and dislikes. Okay, so your first choice is basically what medium are you using? And then once you've discovered or decided what medium you're using, then you have to figure out how you're going to apply that medium to your canvas. So how are you making your marks on your canvas? Are you making them bold? Are you making them delicate? Are you making them sporadic and making them uniform? Those types hey, of darling, things. Yeah. Can you speak a little about um, advantages and disadvantages of style? Sure. Can we do that um, at the it, end of it? Absolutely. Is that okay? Absolutely. Just okay. remind me. because Yes. I'll it. Thank you. Yeah, I would love to hear your, um, your thoughts on it. Okay. Um, so the choice of color versus the lack of color, your choice of color palette is going to be a real big thing that you decide. Some people have um, a real aesthetic around pastel colors. I myself like really bold colors. And so your choice of colors or the lack of color is going to be something that you choose that will be an easy way to identify your work or your or style of your work. Okay. Um, whether you choose to go complex or simple with your work, um, the theme of, of your work. Do you typically work in themes that are more lighthearted? Do you uh, work in themes that are more, um, you know, dramatic and more complex? Um, things like that. And your choice of mood. So are your, is your mood in your work, is it very kind of airy and lighthearted and playful? Or is it um, more, you know, dark and um, dramatic? So the type of all of these things that you come to your canvas with, these are all inherently likes and dislikes that you have within you, your, yourself. And you don't have to do anything other than just go with what you what you know. <laughs> and, and when going with what you know, you are making these choices and those choices become, you know, the first basic part of your style. And those are the choices that you make. Okay. Um, I have this up here. This is um, my literary agency prospect portfolio. And I just have this up because I wanted to show you just if you were to go along, go to any literary agency's um, website, and you were to just take a screenshot like I did of all of the art clients that they represent, you're going to see a huge range of styles, okay? And I'm gonna ask you guys to do this as part of your homework, um, looking at various art styles and you probably already have styles that you were really drawn to that appeal to you, but I'm also actually gonna ask you to do this with intention is, we're gonna, and we're gonna break these things down here too. So we're going to not just look at the artwork and see that they are different. We're going to describe what it is about these artworks that make them different, okay? And it's in that process of identifying those visual elements that we'll be able to utilize those in our own artwork with intention and create, um, create um, making intentional choices, okay? So just looking at, um, Let's look, um, and I now I'm going to go ahead and ask you guys to kind of um, engage with me here. Um, so let's say one of the things that you can do, which I really like to do, is in it, it's it might be easier to um, to describe one thing in relative terms to another. So if I were to say, let's look at Corey Dorfield's artwork compared to Ellen Elliott's artwork, okay? So looking at Corey's up here and Ellen Elliott's, talk about color. What is the first thing you're noticing about color on either of those two artists? And you can just like raise your hand. You can use your, raise your hand, your, use the, I'm sorry, you can use the action, the reactions down at the bottom and then it will make you pop up to the top and then I can call on you and then you can unmute yourself. Ariana, please. Um. Oh. I would say that Ellen's color choices are a bit more bold and compared to Corey's. Yes, 
Absolutely. Okay. And then when you when you speak about like Ellen's, how hers are bold, then that, you know, obviously by saying hers are bold, then Corey's are less bold, but we can also say that um, Corey's work is more desaturated and more subtle, um, at least in this particular image, right? Okay, um, let's say something else. Um, what would you notice about um, the, the, sh the line, the line work in either Corey or Ellen's work? Irina. Uh, I would say that Corey's is bolder. Uh, the line work is bolder, but fuzzier, if if that's the better description, whereas Ellen's more clear cut and uh, deta not detailed, but fine. Mm -hmm. fine. Okay. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Kevin. Um, in Ellen's, I noticed there's a lot of different patterns and textures as opposed yeah. to Corey. Right. Yeah, absolutely. She's definitely utilizing textures and patterns as a part of her stylistic aesthetic. Okay, Wuraola, um, did I say your name right? Can you please correct me? Yes, that's right, Wuraola. Wuraola, <laughs> beautiful. Okay, please yeah. share, well, what are your thoughts? Uh, I think Corey's lines have more weight I mm -hmm. can see the varied weight lines in Corey's work as mm -hmm. opposed to Ellen's work. Right, that's a good catch too. But the lines are bold. Um, there are varied thickness and um, line weight is, is true. And then um, Ellen's has more of a, a clear delineation of line um, used to, to delineate the, the different shapes. And then um, Kevin noticed the, the palettes and then the color, okay. Um, yeah, um, let's see, let's talk about, um, let's see, what else, space? Um, let's talk about, um, let's see, pattern, texture. Um, I know. No, I don't know, I was gonna say. I, I, I to love Cynthia Goals, I'm trying to figure out is it 3D? Oh yeah, Cynthia's is more um, a 3D models of, um, they're actually like, um, yeah, she takes photographs of, of the artwork and then uses that as her illustrations. Okay, so let's say, now we're gonna move over to um, Madeline Gobo and Ashley Goldberg. What are some similarities that you're seeing in those two works? Mira. I don't want to dominate. I'm trying not to. No. <laughs> They're both very graphic. They both yeah. have graphic line-based artwork. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and the big differences, well, um, color choices mm -hmm. and also um, stronger uh, you know, filled in areas mm -hmm. for Ashley. Yeah, yeah that's great. I love them both. I, I love most of the work on this page. Thank you. Okay, Jasmine. There seems to be like a repetition of like the patterns, like how Madeline uses the stars and Ashley uses all the hearts. Beautiful, wonderful observation. That yeah. is great. Absolutely. Destiny. I was going to say they both use line very intentionally, especially in the um, tail of Ashley's. There's intentional line work in the tail and in the mane, and especially the line work in Madeline's. It's um, sparse, but it works. It's, it's not everywhere. It has a place. Yeah, great. Great <laughs> observation. Thank you. And then um, Kevin. Kevin, you're still on mute. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> the, I noticed that that both of them use like, uh, in, in the instance of Madeline, the, the stars and then actually use the hearts. Those pattern, uh, patterns uh, to, to get their points across. Um, 
with both of them. Yeah, that's a real, that's, that's a real interesting thing too. Uh, I want you to notice the movement. Um, movement is an aspect of um, uh, our principle of art and look at the way the pattern is used in both of those that creates a kind of visual movement that brings your eye across the page. Um, thank you, Kevin. Tani. Um, so I noticed kind of their line, like their lines are a little different. Madeline's are more angular and straight while um, Ashley uses more rounded shapes in her artwork, even like in the line work and like the intention behind the shapes that they have of the hearts versus the stars. Yeah, that's a really good observation. Just the line and not only just the line, but the type of shapes that are used. There's more angular shapes, um, even within the pattern of the stars and Madeline's work versus more of a curvilinear kind of thing happening um, with Ashley. Beautiful. Okay. Fantastic work, you guys. Um, let's do one more. Um, let's take a look um, at the work between um, Helen Greetham's and Brian Garrity. What are some things that you are noticing? There's a lot of stark differences. So what are some things that you're noticing that are different between the two? Kevin. Well, um, Helen's is... Uh, a bit more, uh, I'd say like painterly, a painterly kind of style, mm -hmm. whereas Brian's is uh, more like illustrated, like an illustrator's kind of style. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's funny, you're saying that you're describing the difference between them as painterly and illustration in, in illustrative. And in, in like, actually this whole page is, you know, illustration. So the illustrative style is in and of itself, not really, I mean, it is a way to discern the difference between a painterly style, but then in and of itself, like how would we describe that illustrative style? Because that has its own, you know, um, unit, your own unique things within itself, right? Yeah. Um, Ariana, your thoughts. Uh, I would say that Helen's is a bit more complex in comparison to, to Jen's where it's more simplified. Yeah, beautiful. Absolutely. More complex in terms of the subject, in terms of the detail that are included in the illustration. Um, whereas in Brian's, um, the simplistic, it's, a, it's more of a symbolic thing that's happening within the imagery um, where the pillow it, and the, the table and the, the drapery is, is done very simple, almost like in a symbol, symbolic way. Thank you. Alyssa. Yeah, I was going to say some people mentioned that Helen's had more of a painterly vibe. And I mm -hmm. guess, I, I don't know, I guess the colors are more harmonious in that one compared to the to Brian's. Mm. It has kind of cooler tones versus warmer tones. And then with Brian's, it's, uh, the emphasis I'm seeing is a lot of pink. But then, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah. that it has more emphasis on one color where the Helen's have more of a connection. Yeah, yeah, that's a great thing to notice too. Like the, the, the color choice in Brian's is very intentional. Well, there's a repetition of uh, the solid color pink throughout, um, and that's done in a way to create contrast and create a focal point. We'll talk about that too. Um, and whereas Helen's work is more um, kind of unified, harmonious um, within the colors, it's a broader range of color, but um, it's a, a more, it's a wider range of color. Mark. To me, they both seem like they have a triangular composition, but with mm -hmm. Brian's, there's a strong diagonal to the right with that white drape mm -hmm. where my eye really goes to. Yeah. You know, of course, they look more, you know, Brian's looks more for younger children, mm -hmm. kiddos, but Helen's, you know, more adults, so you could use more detail, more realistic. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. really interesting that you picked up on that, um, that you have that feeling that one would be more um, relatable to a younger audience than the other. Uh, is, that is something that definitely, this, that publishers intentionally, you know, do with um, creating the look of their book. They are mindful of the audience and what, um, what their audience might, um, 
resonate, what would resonate best with our audience? Marola? Uh, yes, I would say that Helen's work seems to have a lot more light. Like I can see the direction of the light and the shading. Brands might look flat, but I can mm. also see the direction based on the drape and the black at the back. So their use of light is different. Yeah, that's a really good thing to notice too. Yeah, that there's like a overall light source um, that's affecting all of the objects in Helen's work, whereas in Brian, it's more of a flat. There's not real light and shading on the characters on them on their own nor is there like a drop shadow underneath the characters but there is a a sense of light and shadow in the imagery what about texture there's no sense of texture kevin your hand's been up it hasn't gone down so i'll just call on you again oh. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah did you want to add something No? Okay. No, Riley. No, no. That's okay. Riley. Hi. Hi. Um, I would say that Brian's um, has sort of some flat um, moments of texture in the art piece, but then in the back, there's some like rough kind of it resembles charcoal sort of for the mm -hmm. background. Mm -hmm. um, and Helen's, I think, has a pretty um mostly flat but add some texture with the line work mm -hmm. yeah there's some texture with the line work and helen's work um and there's some texture in the coloration too which is really nice and then brian's got more of a it looks like a kind of a charcoal or a pastel -y kind of feel on the overall background and so the way the texture is used in this image in brian's work is almost a, is like a color field where the texture is kind of differentiating the foreground from the background. And so that's, um, that's an intentional um, stylistic choice too. Okay, you guys did great. Can um, I just comment on something? Yes, Mira, please. Uh, stylistically, Helen's work is very romantic, mm -hmm. whereas Brian's is much more playful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can see that too. Um, definitely more playful with the life, even just looking at the expression of the characters in Brian's work. We've got this little pug that just is so yeah. fun looking and um, you have more of a um, kind of a romantic feeling in Helen's um, work with it. Though even just the way the characters are drawn in both are completely different. So that's mm -hmm. really there's a difference in that too. And we didn't even talk about that. We were just talking about the way that the, the, the elements were used. So this is great. You guys are doing fantastic. This is something that I want you to kind of continue to kind of do um, this week as we move on. So I'm gonna kind of continue on um, here. Okay, so. Uh, okay. The ingredients in the recipe of art making is basically what we've been looking at. We've been looking at the elements of art and we've been looking at the principles of, of art and design. And the elements of art are basically like the tools that you use. So your first choice, right, is which medium do you use? The second choice is how do you apply that medium to your canvas and how you use the tool is the elements of art. That's, those, are the, those are like the ingredients of your recipe, so to speak, and how you apply those on your canvas are the choices that you make. And with each of those elements of art, line, color, value, shape, form, texture, and space, you are deciding how to use those or whether or not you use any of those or which, which ones you use and which ones you don't, which ones you wanna focus on and emphasize more, um, or which one do you wanna completely omit, okay? So that's the first thing I want you to start thinking of in terms of like the ingredients of what you're using. Line, everything starts with a mark and that mark is a line. Um, when you create the connection of a line to itself, it creates a shape. And that shape, there's variations on shape. There's organic shapes, there's symmetrical shapes, there's, um, 
inorganic, there's, um, you know, there's a variety of shapes, large, small, um, and whether they connect or they're disconnected, whether they're harmonious and things like that. Um, form, the form is basically the creation of three dimension on a flat shape. So are you using shapes that then you then create the feeling of three dimensional form? Are you utilizing the feeling of texture um, to create um, variety and things like that? So the elements of the art are the tools that you use. Now, how you use those tools are the principles of art. So like I said, are you using shape? Um, are you using texture to create um, harmony in your work? Are you using textures to create a sense of pattern or emphasis in your work? Are you using textures to create contrast? So in Brian's work, we noticed that he had texture in his background, but not in his foreground. So that's an interesting way to say like, hmm, he was using texture in that sense to create a contrast from his foreground and his background. Whereas um, the, the, um, the color um, in Corey Darfield's work with the, um, with the rabbit and um, the little girl, she's using color in a more subdued way, whereas the other um, woman was using um, color and patterns and the patterns were emphasizing certain things. So we're gonna look at these, we're gonna get to know these really inherently because we are gonna start to deconstruct art just like we've done just now. So what you wanna do is you wanna learn how to break apart the elements of artwork that you look at, okay? And by identifying the individual aspects of artwork and seeing the work as separate elements, you'll be better able to understand how to work with those individual elements on their own in your own work, okay? Now, here's something to keep in mind. Just because you can identify it doesn't mean that you can actually utilize it yourself. This is the process. This is the thing where I was saying you have a vision and you have your capabilities and there is a gap between where you want to see your work and what you're actually capable of. But don't worry. The first thing is to actually become aware of what those elements of art are where they are in the work that you're seeing. And then you're also going to deconstruct your own work. But in this process, in that process, you will be better able to uh, equip to kind of self-coach or self-model for yourself the areas that you want to improve on. Um, so you can start to develop um, the skills in order to understand how to bring those certain elements of art and utilize them as tools um, in your own artwork for the service of creating appealing narrative illustrations and imagery, okay? So we're just gonna go through all the elements of art really, really quick. So line can be any mark that you make on the page, whether you're using thin or thick, bold or delicate, um, hairy or smooth, confident or weak, the type of line that you use in your work is an element of art. Now you probably already have a natural way that you use line. And I want you to look at that in your own artwork and kind of des describe to yourself how you are using line. And you can, you, you can look at the, not just, you're gonna look at a lot of different artwork on your own, a lot of different artwork that you've done. Um, and you're gonna break that down, okay? So be mindful of line and how line is used to create um, shape and color. Actually, I, I thought I had shape after that, but the next is color. But color in, we'll get into color theory in a little bit later in the class, but your choice of color is obviously something we noticed in those um, um, different stylistic aspects of the portfolio, whether you're using a full range of color, whether you're using a limited gamut of color and the ways that you can choose colors in a limited way or there's various ways you can choose to only use primary colors. Maybe you're only choosing to use analogous colors. Analogous colors are colors that are neighboring each other on the color wheel. Um, other they have different emotional responses. Yes. Like primary and complementary tend to really pop. Analogous colors are very calming and soothing. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Thank you. Yes. And the, the reason why you would choose these different um, limitations of color could have a lot to do with the mood and the theme of your own work and what you're intending to do. Okay. Here's one of Mira's slides, value. So when using, are you using value in your work um, to show uh, light and dark? And this is a way of kind of creating a more realistic effect because you're then creating the feeling of having a light source um, in within um, that's impacting the subjects or the scenery of your artwork. And we'll talk about using value a little bit more, but that's something that you can start looking at in um, your own artwork if some if if um, you use a lot of value or um, you like art that has a broad range of value. Um, some um, if you've been in any of my open studio sessions, you know that I'm always talking about value as a way of approaching a, a stronger relationship to color. And we'll talk about that too. But um, understanding value um, is another um, important aspect of um, as a principle or I'm sorry, an element of art. Okay, so shape. Line that can, uh, a line that connects with itself becomes a shape. And so we have a range of shapes, geometric, organic. We also have positive and negative shapes. And that's something completely kind of different, but more um, in terms of how we think about creating uh, harmonious uh, compositions or balanced compositions. Now, harmony and balance are one of the, our two principles of art. So whether you're mindful of positive and negative shapes can in impact whether or not you have harmonious or balanced compositions. Okay. And form is the creation of three-dimensional shape from a two-dimensional shape. Uh, so you're taking, you're actually using things like light and value to create a sense of um, depth in your artwork. Um, three dimensions comes from height, width, and depth. And two dimension is simply just height and width. So you see that in the rectangle and the triangle and the circle, those are just basic flat two-dimensional shapes because they're only describing the height and the width. But the second we add in that three dimension, the depth, which is the shapes kind of going backward, then we're introducing form. And whether or not you want to create form in your artwork is something that you can think about and how you create form is um, another um, aspect of utilizing the tools, um, utilizing value to create form, um, utilizing um, line to create form. Those are all things that you can do. Texture, now texture can be implied or actual, whether you're, I mean, if you're using, now this is a digital class, right? So we're not using actual textures um, like on our canvas um, to create like a raised surface. But the fantastic thing about using, using digital tools is that we can utilize textures as, um, as um, in our artwork to create patterns, to create a feeling of fur, to create, um, you know, feelings of rough or smooth, um, anything you want, basically. Um, and you can utilize, and I actually do have a texture library that I'm gonna, gonna write myself a note to. Ooh, give you share access. with us? Yes. Ooh. I know, isn't that exciting? It's totally texture exciting. Library. Um, I'll share a, a texture library for you guys to utilize too. Um, and so, yeah, the whether or not you even include texture in your artwork, um, you can, that's a choice that you can make. Okay, space, the final frontier. Um, space can be shallow or deep, um, whether you're creating a sense of, of, you know, maybe form or depth in your work is kind of the, the depiction of space, whether there is a feeling of depth, like in the uh, image on the right, there's a feeling of depth because of the foreground, middle ground and background area, these three separate areas in the illustration that is giving the feeling of depth because you have the, the, 
the um, family in the foreground, they're much larger, they're lower on the picture plane. That gives a feeling of depth between them and the bus. We know the bus is much larger than the people, but because of the placement of the bus and it's much smaller, we understand inherently, I mean, because it is higher up on the picture plane, we understand inherently that that is further away. It is behind the man and the front. So because of the overlapping, we have a feeling that there is space between the characters in the foreground and the bus in the middle ground. And because the bus is larger than the, um, the house or building in the back, um, because of the size relationship, we know that the, that the thing that is in the smallest things in the back and that are also higher up on the picture plane are further away, thus creating even more depth. So by being mindful of creating space in your imagery, whether or not that's something you want to do, that's another stylistic choice that you can make. Okay, and emphasis. Now emphasis is just, is we're getting into um, the principles of art. So the emphasis is how you can use the elements like value, color, texture, pattern, things like that to emphasize your main focal point. Um, it's the way that you bring the viewer's attention to the thing that you want them to see, the thing that you want them to look at. Is the thing that you want them to look at your main character? Is the thing you want them to look at um, a particular object in a, a panel of your web comic um, or your regular comic? What are you emphasizing and how would you emphasize it? And the ways that you can emphasize um, any particular thing are done in, um, in the number of ways. You can use contrast, you can use grouping, converging lines, and um, contrast is usually the what I would focus on the most. Um, and we'll get more into that when we get into composition, okay? And then rhythm and patterns. I love rhythm and um, patterns. Patterns are a lot of fun. And you notice that in um, two of the artworks that we were looking at earlier. Um, the patterns occur when elements which has something in common are repeated to create a rhythm. So you have regular and irregular um, patterns. Um, and the creation of patterns can be really fun. That's just a joy in and of itself. If you've ever just sat and just drawn, um, you know, a shape over and over and over again. I don't know if you've ever like doodle, if you're talking on the phone or something, if you ever doodle patterns or anything like that. Um, it's sometimes just the act of mark making a pattern or creating a rhythmic pattern can be a lot of fun. All right, and contrast. So contrast is a principle that we are gonna be focusing on a lot because that is how I, that is the one principle I like to use to make sure that we are creating emphasis on our focal point. And we use contrast in these very many ways, okay? And when you are utilizing a lot of these together, you are then really able to emphasize your focal point in terms of contrast. So by for instance, if you were, um, when we look at that, the detail in um, the image above, um, we have more of a contrast of the foreground, the hands in the foreground, there is a thicker line weight on those arms compared to the, the people in the very back that are all sitting on the orange chairs. The size is um, larger, obviously, then we have um, color, it's brighter, there's more of a highlight on the, um, foreground uh, hands and there are in the background um, imagery too. So the things that you can do to create contrast, those are things that you're going to want to remember um, in terms of how you can create um, more appealing um, imagery and basically understanding how to create contrast in your artwork is a way to create compelling images so that you are giving, you are showing the viewer what you want them to look at. And by understanding contrast, you can make it so that your viewer looks at the thing that you want them to look at. And really appealing imagery is when, is anything where you're looking and you're looking at your, um, the image and your eye is kind of going around the image in a particular way and is, is seeing the thing that you want them, you the artist are wanting them to see, okay. Unity and balance is another principle. So um, when all the elements in your artwork look as though they belong together or work harmoniously together, this is 
unity. And the ways that you can do that are um, with proximity and repetition. Um, I love the radial um, balance, uh, mandala at the bottom. That's one that's symmetri symmetrical um, unity and balance. And then um, above that is an asymmetrical imagery where we have the visual weight of the female character on the right is a lot heavier than um, the weight of the visual weight of the cat on the right. Okay. And then movement. So movement is basically the feeling of your eye moving across the page because the way that the visual elements are arranged on the picture plane, it guides your eye through the imagery. And so we see that in Marcel Duchamp's um, painting of the nude descending a staircase and then Vincent van Gogh's starry, um, starry night, the famous painting. And then in, uh, above the imagery, we have movement of the, um, the, the linear aspect of the orange line kind of coming across and then the patterns on the, the dress. And then we have the patterns around the outside edge kind of creates movement around that. And then of course we have the uh, snake coming out from the, the, um, the rocks. And so that has kind of a movement that directs our eye towards this line of the, uh, the ground or the sand up to the shoes and up to the, the character there. Okay. And then variety. Variety is utilizing different um, different elements, different size, different shapes, different colors in your um, artwork to create interest in your composition. All right, what do you do with all this? Okay, well, we're gonna explore, okay? Now in your process of exploring, I want you to get really keyed in to what brings you pain. <laughs> and then also get really keyed into what brings you joy. So in your processes of exploration, okay, you're going to, um, you're going to be playing with all the different brushes. This is your chance to just really play with all the different brushes at your, at your disposal, um, the different line, um, the different um, brushes that create line, the different brushes that create um, texture. And I want you to explore the process and get to know the tools that you like that bring you happiness because you're an artist and art should be happy, right? Um, and in the process of creating art, the, the happier you are, the better your art will be, <laughs> I kid you not. Um, and Chantel and Berger will talk about this um, tomorrow, um, but also joy and ease versus pain and struggle. So the ease in which you, you use your brushes um, and your tools are um, something to be mindful of because if you understand how to use a particular brush first and how to get a particular look using a, a brush versus using another brush, you know, like even was, Eden was doing a, a demonstration and she was doing the just the simplest thing. She was drawing a little line and she was like, I don't like that brush right? We know what brushes we like and br what brushes we don't. Like you have probably thousands of brushes, especially in Photoshop that you're never going to use because you don't like them. Or, you know, you, maybe you haven't figured it out. And Gret brushes makes a, you know, a ton of brushes. Procreate, there's a ton of brushes available just because there are all those brushes available to you doesn't mean you have to use them. But in this process this week, I really want you to kind of explore the brushes that you have available to you and decide which ones you really like to use. And then I want you to make a little section of those brushes and have those in your toolkit, okay? You know, when you're actually, okay, I, I never leave, when I go on vacation or anywhere, I never leave without my sketchbook and my pencil pouch. Okay, so it's like making a little pencil pouch. You're gonna take, you're gonna create, you're gonna find the tools that you love. You're gonna designate those as your favorite tools and mm -hmm. you're gonna put them in a little pencil pouch, so to speak, or you're gonna group them and maybe Eden, I haven't, I just now thought of this, but I can show you how to do this in Photoshop and Clip Studio. 
Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna write that. Um, I'm, I'm assuming you're gonna make a Google Drive folder like we normally yes. have for our yes. classes. Yes, and we'll so, I'll go over that for sure. Hopefully by ten o'clock tonight, I will have that one uploaded. Um, and then I'll also do a uh, mini one about how you can put brushes that you like all in one folder, so you don't have to keep going back and being and like, did I? Him. Yeah, like did I like that one from my this oil pack or this oil pack. And that way you can just have that quick little, mine is called Favo. That's my, Favo. See? yep. All my favorite brushes. So mm -hmm. I will do one for that as well. Cause that definitely helped me because finding brushes is not the problem. Getting free artist brushes or even paying right. five bucks. There's so right. much beautiful content out there, but then it can be kind of overwhelming when you have it all. Right. Yeah. And can you I said you have five brushes out of your like hundreds that you yeah use. and I think every digital artist only really needs three solid brushes that they can consistently use which is something to sketch with something to ink with and something that has a little bit of texture yeah that's that's I think really all you need all five yeah all five, five five is good I would say start with three and then you can level up as your art levels up you can start playing and actually finding other texture tools and whatnot yeah yeah. Hey, can I do a shout out for Groot brushes? I'm yes. not an affiliate, but I love those brushes. They're so yeah. amazing. The Groot brushes are good. And they're only $20. Mm -hmm. And you can get them free. The Photoshop and the Photoshop brushes work in Clip Studio mm -hmm. or for Procreate. Yeah. The Brett brushes? Groot. G R U T. G U R T E. Groot. Like grit with a U. Okay, perfect. I will yeah, look awesome. those up and link them for people. They're wonderful. Grit. Okay, beautiful. Thank you, Mira, for sharing that. My pleasure. Okay, sorry, I just had to ask my housemate to not pound on ice. Okay. Um, okay, so you're gonna get to know your, your, the things that you like versus the things that you don't like, okay, in this process. All right, so capabilities. Okay, so appreciate the various methods of art making, but become attuned to what you are capable of achieving in your own work. And that's okay right now, okay? You're gonna be learning a lot of stuff right in this class. Um, but I also want you to be aware of what you are able to do and what you're not able to do. So when you're looking at work and you're discerning what the, and you're just deconstructing what the elements of art are in artwork that you like, I want you to, to you're going to, there's a, a worksheet, you're going to make a, uh, a note as to whether or not these elements of art that you like are things that you can actually do. Okay. And look at your own work and judge whether or not the things that you're seeing in other people's artwork are things that you can do or things that you can't do. And if there are things that you can't do, I want you to just make a little note of it and say, well, this is something that I really want to do, but I don't know how. Okay. Bye Riley. Thanks for being here. Um, so be aware of that and don't, don't be hard. Judge yourself about it. Just, just become attuned to what it is that you are able to do. Like if you I'll, sh I'll show you in the, the, uh, the exercise coming up. I went that, I just wanted to put that there. Okay. So how do you identify your likes and your dislikes? What mediums and methods are appealing to you? Do you like oil painting mediums? Do you like to be able to blend things? Do you want flat color? Do you like watercolor? What are the things that you like? And then why? Why do, you, why do you like to do those things? Like, do you like to be bold? Or do you like to be delicate? And then identify your color palette. What's your color palette look like? Do you like to use all the color palette, all the colors? And maybe you are using all the colors and maybe we need to like teach you how to not use all the colors, but that's okay. Like, like if you like to use all the colors, like write it down, like why do you like to use a lot of colors? Um, or do you like to use fewer colors? We, we will talk about, regardless, we will narrow your color down in this course because that's something that, um, that I, I definitely see a lot of 
in my student work in the open studio session. We'll talk about how to use color in a strong way. Okay. What mark making is appealing to you? Do you like complexity or do you like simplicity? So I really like simple stuff, but I also like complex stuff. So it's like, where do I put the simple stuff? Where do I put the complex stuff? And you know, how do I go about that? Okay, lots of things to look at, okay? So what you like versus what you are capable of achieving. So what you wanna do is you wanna be able to understand what the things are that you like, cause that's a whole category of things that you like. Like maybe you love, you're an artist, and you can create art, but you also have a lot of art taste, things that you really love. Now, a lot of the stuff that you really, really like, you might actually not be able to do, which is okay, but I want you to be able to discern whether or not those are things that you can achieve or not. Being able to describe what is appealing to you is important, but being able to discern whether those elements of art are ingredients that you have in your toolkit and accessible to you are also important because you can, you can alter or you can begin to work intentionally on bringing about certain stylistic aesthetics to your work by using that as a kind of a goalpost and saying, I really want to get better with creating form. How do I do that? I want, like, I really love the work of so-and-so artists and I really want to create and emulate that type of work. So how would I do that? So that becomes an area of of like a goalpost where you can kind of put yourself and say, this is something that I really want to work on. And that's something that you need to identify so we can help you meet that goal, right? Developing a style comes from the process of creating work in a consistent way that can be differentiated from others' work. So creating a body of work is basically just you repeating those consistent choices that you make over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again, so that all of your artwork looks like it belongs in the same universe? Are you always using bold brush strokes with um, limited color, with um, patterns and texture, with a lot of movement? If you're creating artwork with those four things consistently and always using those four ingredients to create a recipe of artwork, that those choices then no matter what you draw and you're always doing those four things, that creates a style. And that style is, is what is identifiable that can then be differentiated from other people's work, okay? So this is why I come to style with this broad sense because I have been identifying the ingredients that bring me joy. I have been able to look at artwork and say, I really love the way this artist does this. And I really love the way this artist does that. And I identify those things and I, and I look at my own work and I think I would like to create my own joy in my own artwork. And I would like to, to do the, this type of mark making that brings me joy. So you're also, you're, you're being aware of the things that you're already doing. And you're also looking at ways at other things that make you happy. Okay. Other things in artwork, in the art world and creating art that makes you happy that you can also bring into your work. Okay. So it's just exploring but with intention, because you're looking at them as specific elements, okay? So look at what you do naturally. That is already there. You're all here with your own way of doing things. You're gonna look at what you're doing already, okay? You're gonna break down those elements. And then you're gonna look at other art styles and you're gonna look at the ingredients and elements and recipes and you're gonna look and see what are those aspects that I would like to bring into my work with intention, okay? Now, the trick is, can you combine those in a new way that still creates ease and joy rather than pain and struggle? And let's say you have a style that's very delicate and very uh, subdued colors, but you really wanna move past that and you wanna to go to bold strokes and you wanna to go to bold color, but doing it is a real struggle for you. You just can't seem to like push down hard enough on the pen. You just can't seem to pick the bigger brushes. You just can't seem to choose those other colors. And when you do, you don't know how. So the struggle is in the feeling that you get when you're using it or maybe the frustration that you have when you're using particular tools or playing with the work in certain way. Those are things to be mindful of. Now there's a natural struggle that comes from, you know, learning. And then there's a natural struggle that comes from 
you know, trying to do something that's not natural. So these are all things that I want you to be mindful of. Lots of things to think about. Okay. How are you going to do this? The first thing you need to do, let me check my time. You're going to gather all the things that you've made. Okay. Now I, I have already kind of compiled all this information. I already thought about this, but then I found this website that had it all kind of like ready to go. So I, I got this from how to find your art style. Um, you're going to gather all the things that you've made and you're going to look at them. Okay. You're going to look at them and you are going to look at the things that you've made that you really, really like. Okay. Now don't be defined by a particular type of art or medium. Just, just like, look at all the stuff that you've done and you're like, yeah, this is good. I like this. Okay. Um, and then try to look at it for the first time. So remember, you want to look at it for your deconstructing it. You're looking for what elements of art you use, how you use those. Okay. How did you, how did you put those marks on the page and what were the choices that you made? Okay. What words can you just use to describe them? Okay. And then if you can arrange them chronologically, that'd be interesting to see how your style has changed. That's not always an interesting thing, but most of all, first thing I want you to do is I want you to look at your stuff that you've done and deconstruct it. Okay. The next thing is you're going to gather all the things you like. Okay. So if you have Pinterest, you can, you know, if you already have a board, you probably already have a board of all the things that you like. Um, but I want you at least to, you know, create in one place, some kind of a mood board that shows the aesthetics that you really, really like in art. Maybe you have particular artists that you really like their work. You can just kind of click cut and paste screen, screen grab images and put them all in one place. Okay. And that is going to start to tell you about what it is that you love, what you like. And then you're going to start to look at that and think and deconstruct that, break that down. Okay. Make a list of the artists that you adore and your favorite pieces from them. So that's kind of going in that same thing. You're looking at art that you like, and then you're going to notice the artists that you like, and then your favorite pieces from them. Okay. It says mimic them. I wouldn't say mimic them, but what the, the process of mimicking them is more like um, what I said, taking the bits and pieces and noticing what it is that you like to see in them. Okay. Now, creating parameters for your work. Okay. So infinite choices creates infinite possibilities, which is kind of overwhelming. So you're going to limit your choices by limiting the ingredients you use in your work. So you're going to choose by default versus choosing with, no, you're, you've always chosen by default. So you're going to choose with intention this time. Sorry. Um, so be mindful of your capabilities in this process when you're doing this, but you're going to take on one element that you want to improve and you can work on that um, and develop that over time. And by practicing how to develop that skill over time, okay? All right, so here's your homework, week one. Research and explore, this is a fun week. I mean, <laughs> it's all fun, <laughs> but I got some worksheets for you, okay? So research and explore. The first is you're gonna look at your work. You're gonna take notes on what elements of art principles of design you use, and you're gonna write it down. How about how back are you going with all the things you made? Should you just take it back a year or past six months? If you made something that you think was really bomb, like the bomb, like five years ago, use it. That's fine. Yes, these slides will be available, Alyssa. Um, just whatever you've done. And, you know, if you did something in third grade, you were like, oh, this is so awesome. Yeah, pull that. <laughs> use it. Okay. Then the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna look at work that you love and you're gonna take notes on what elements of art and principles of designs are used in that. And then last, you're gonna explore using specific elements of art and principles of design and intentionally create different styles of the same imagery. So this is when you get to draw, number three, worksheet three, when you get to draw, okay. So let me stop sharing that real quick. We're going into Photoshop, okay doing here okay so um uh, go back to sharing and i know i'm mindful of the time we have 20 minutes okay i'm gonna go on photoshop all right and i have that i'm gonna adjust my camera my camera is on my 
Surface Studio. So I have to like adjust that. I'm gonna close this out. No, okay, here we go. Okay, worksheet one. These are gonna be available for you. I'm actually going to, um, I'll, I'll show you guys where they're gonna be um, before we go. This is your style worksheet number one. Okay, you're gonna, and you're gonna take these images and you, you can just um, draw or write in them, or you can copy and paste um, screenshots from artwork and you're gonna put your artwork, put your homework on these worksheets. So turn these in with your filled out, okay? So one is look at your work, list and describe the elements of art and principles of design that you currently use. And if there's not enough room on that, um, you can just make it a little bit smaller. You can write outside of the, the margin. And the on the side are the elements of art and the um, principles of art, okay? So those are the things you're gonna be looking for in your artwork. The bottom box is what elements of art and principles of design would you like to incorporate more into your work? Okay, so this is where we go with intention. All right, think about that, fill that out. Okay, number two, this is your style worksheet number two. You're going to study a few artist styles that you like. And here, I want you to turn this in and you can um, do more than one page if you've got like maybe four artists or five artists, just fill it out. Okay, um, but you're going to copy and paste the artwork. Here, you're gonna put the name of the artist up at the top and then you're gonna describe the work. And we're gonna do this right now together, okay? Um, yeah, I've got like 18 minutes, 15 minutes. So copy and paste a small screenshot of a portion of their work here. You're gonna use the space beside it to describe the ingredients and the recipe. So you remember the ingredients are the elements of art and the recipes are the principles of art, how they use it. Okay, so here's four pieces of artwork, two from each artist. So um, my, you've ever taken my class before, you know, you've heard me say that Kadir Nelson is my all time favorite artist. Okay, so I'm gonna describe the work right here. So what I'm gonna do, let's see, painterly, right? That's my first impression right there, um, color, really, um, really saturated colors. Okay. He has realistic colors too. Okay. Cause I love the way he's, he, he depicts brown skin tone. I love the way he uses light and value. Okay. Um, let's see what else his compositions are really strong in terms of the space. Okay. He uses space in a really smart way, negative space, okay? Um, also the way he composes his imagery like this with these triangular things, that's this a little bit more deeper. Um, oh, geez. Okay, but um, what did I write? Negative space? Yeah, that was supposed to be negative space, okay? Um, pattern. There's a pattern here that's happening in the background. Also, the way he does um, realistic, but then the, also the way he is um, illustrating the hair. That's a real um, kind of whimsical, fun way that he does that. So it's realistic, but there's some kind of exaggerated, um, exaggerated nature to that. Let's see what else. In terms of um, color and line, there is line, kind of subdued subdued, subdued, it's delicate, okay, he's got form and shape, the shapes are natural, okay, um, color, texture, he does have texture, you can see the texture from the canvas or the paper in there, that's really nice, okay, all right, here's my other favorite artist, artist David Shannon. Okay, and this is from um, this is from um, the Bad Case of Stripes, and then um, the Pirate Book. Okay, uh, let's see. So, what do I notice about this? His bold. I love the color. Okay, oops, color. 
It's bold, saturated. It's very painterly as well. There's some texture there. There's um, there is line. He uses line. It's, it almost looks like it's like, and if you look, it, if you're familiar with his work, he did um, No David No. Um, and in that work in particular, he really uses um, line in a more childlike way, but he still has that here. It's really playful. Line is playful, if that can be a determination or description or whatever. Um, uh, let's see, texture, space, he's got um, space. He uses depth in his work. And uh, let's see what else we were gonna look at the worksheet here. Um, value, patterns, mm, I don't know. So that those are some things that I would notice, okay? All right, so you're gonna do that as many times for as many art works that you like, okay? Here's the last one. This is where you're gonna have fun, okay? Style worksheet number three. I have like 10 minutes. Okay, so in this, this one, you can do this just one page, or if you wanna do more than one page, you can do more than one page. Um, but I, I wanna see at least six, okay? So this is, you guys are familiar with the draw this in your style meme thing. Is that a meme? I don't know. The draw this in my style. So you're gonna draw a cat sitting below a windowsill in various styles. All right? Yes. All right. So for each of these, you're going to intentionally limit your, your choices and set your parameters before you begin. Okay. And you can even do this in terms of like, whether you draw a realistic cat or a cartoony cat. Okay. It's up to you. But the prompt is draw a cat sitting below a windowsill. And actually I want, here's another thing that I didn't add. I want you to add, okay, let's do this. Can I open that up? Why are you not opening that up? I'm just gonna draw it in on top, cancel. I'm gonna draw on a new layer on top. And I'm gonna add this in the, the below windowsill. Cause you know how cats sit um, where the sun is sitting? Mm -hmm. in a pool of sunlight, okay? And it's not a literal pool. It's just like the, the, the sun is sitting, they're sitting on the sun, okay? So that means you're gonna have something like this, all right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna adjust this so I can just draw, all right? Magic time. Now, Larissa, do you encourage them to use the same composition for each? Yes, or, okay. thank you. Yes, so this is not about composition. This is about exploring your medium. And style. And your style, thank you, okay? So let's say, you know, you can draw literally the same thing and then copy and paste it over and over again, or you can you can draw it different ways each time. It's up to you. If you wanna explore more of the paint, the painterly approach to it, or the graphic approach to it. Or try different brushes with it. Try different brushes with it. I think that's definitely a good way to go, okay? So I'm gonna have like the sun, it's coming down here. Okay, so I'm gonna draw a cat. Hmm. The cat. Right here. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so even this, this way that I've drawn this cat, that's the style. <laughs> it's simple. It's kind of graphic. It's kind of cartoony. I don't know. All right. And I've used this pencil to draw that. All right. All right. So there's the window. And then maybe I'll come in here and um, I'm going to use my
I just, I'm using this pencil. I don't even know which pencil it is, but nice pencil. So, you know, that's a choice. Alyssa asks, should yes. we try to reference artists we're inspired by when making the different styles? Absolutely. Or is it specifically making limits to experiment on our own? Both. Thank you. Okay. So this is an opportunity for you to emulate other artists. So you can take that worksheet that you did, worksheet number two here, where you describe the artwork. And you can say, all right, I'm gonna try this Kadir Nelson approach. I'm gonna use painterly texture. I'm gonna be mindful of my negative space. I'm gonna you know, try to do realistic drawing, but exaggerate it a little bit, have it a little bit more caricatured. I'm gonna use a delicate line. I'm gonna use creating the sense of form. Okay, and that's, that's if you can, you know, these are, this is a place where you are going to explore, okay? So it's up to you whether you want to, you know, you can explore by intentionally creating artwork, utilizing the elements that you found, or you can do it on your own where you say, all right, here, I'm only going to use bold and you can write it down below, right? Bold, you can kind of describe it to yourself. In fact, I should probably make it so that there's bigger spaces so you can kind of describe it bold color um, and patterns. Okay, so in this one here, and then maybe this one is going to be um, um, delicate, simple, subdued. You know, just some words that you can use to describe it. And then um, here's another thing too, keep your line work on one layer then do your color on another layer. You can do your color on top or underneath or whatever, depending on what you're gonna do. But let's say if I wanted to do delicate, uh, delicate uh, line work and subdued color. So maybe for my subdued color, I'm only gonna choose colors that are in this area of my color hue. They're gonna be a little bit more lighter and they're gonna be more gray. They're not gonna be up in this area, which is basically like straight out of the tube color. So I'm gonna limit my color choices to maybe this area of my color hue, color cube. And I might, um, let's see, let's take something like this. And I'm gonna use my selection tool, I'm gonna fill that in. Fill that in with some color there. And I'm only gonna color on that layer. So now that I've selected that, I'm gonna lock We're not worried about rendering or anything. You're just playing with exploring the different ways um, to do each image. And I'm actually just gonna use the color, this pencil. I think that's kind of fun. Use the color pencil here, okay. I'm just gonna talk uh, out loud real yes, quick, please. Larissa. Um, so first off, uh, Shannon asked, can the blank worksheets be dropped in Discord or attached to an email so we can easily download them? And I responded to that saying that you will be creating a Google Drive, which people yes. can pull from. Mm -hmm. um, and I then do that. the second question was, Jasmine asked, just to clarify for myself, it's the same pose, just different styles of line art and or coloring. And the answer I believe to that is yes, it is going to take less work off of you to use the exact same competent or composition. So yeah. Larissa has this beautiful drawing. She will repeat that same exact idea concept of yeah. that drawing and just mm -hmm. apply different artistic elements to who she's being inspired from. Right. And I'm going to go ahead and complete this on my own and drop this in the, um, in the Google file. And I'm going to go over the Google file for you right now. I'm going to save this real quick. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing. And then, um, where this is where you guys are going to be um, accessing the files. 
oops, exit. Hold on one second. Okay, there's a little chores. Okay. Real, my one last quick question, Larissa, yeah. which I think is a pretty important one. How long per image should people be spending on this? Because it seems like something people can easily lose themselves into. I think, though, that's part of the joy. Just um, how much you want to put into it? Yeah, you know, that's something that you get to discover on your own. I'm not going to put a timeline on this. Just complete them. Mm-hmm. Complete them and do them and have fun with them. Um, if you really are enjoying the process of creating one thing, hey, you know what? That's information. That tells you something. That tells you what's bringing you joy. And that might be something that you, you, you continue to work in in the future. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to share this right now. I'm going to get the link. No, I'm going to anyone with the link. All right, so I'm going to copy this. Copy, 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 copy link. And I'm going to email this out as well as dropping it in the chat right now. Everyone. Okay. Now, this is where you will, we will be sharing information in your homework. Okay. This is my digital illustration course, OCIS or OCR Studios. Okay. And you'll have access to that. When you get access to that, you'll notice that there's two folders homework submission and resources. This is where I give you stuff. This is where you give me stuff, okay? Resources is gonna be divided into week, okay? This, this the, the slides I just did are right here. I'm gonna drop this in week one right now. That's supposed to be where it is. Okay, that's fine. Everyone will get access to that. Okay, so I'm gonna, ask, I'm gonna click on that. In this week one resources folder is the style worksheet number one. Okay, you can see that. You can open it up here. You can go down here, over here to download. You'll download that. I'm gonna drop the other files in there too. You'll get access to those. Now, how do you submit your homework? You're gonna take this, the worksheets that I gave you. You're gonna download them. You're gonna put them in your painting program. You're gonna draw on them, fill them out. And when you're done, you're gonna put them back in homework submission week one you're gonna drop them in here. See how it says drop files here? All you gotta do is click on your file folder, choose your file folder, click and drag in there. So look, I got style worksheet number two. I'm gonna click in and drag and put that in the other plate where that goes. That goes into resources here, week two. I'm gonna to go to my file folder here and take care of that. Where did it go? Style worksheet number two, click and drag there that is available. Okay, great. Any questions? I just wanted to say about style. Yes, Mira, you were going to say, I'm sorry, I talked all the way through. Okay. Um, Chantal and Bergen, yes. who you'll be meeting tomorrow. Yes. They are artists who like to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. and work in a really wide range of styles. But the people that make the most money and that um, tend to have like a really fantastic um, high profile careers have a very distinctive style. Have a look at um, Larissa. Oh, well, name some Lane Smith, who's yeah. a phenomenal artist, mm-hmm. Dan Santat. You look at their work and you know it's their work. Mm-hmm. And that makes them more um, marketable mm-hmm. and more, um, what's the word for it, Larissa? I'm so exhausted. Um, I don't know. I was going to share. Sorry, go ahead. More marketable, um, more value. Right. Value. Right. Identifiable. Yeah. Identifiable. Them. Yeah. Right. Identifiable. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for mentioning me. And I forgot to share this. This is my checklist of my style that I created that I took the time to do. 
over a course of, um, it's the same exercise that I'm giving you, okay? I figured out what it is that I like. I put it down on a list, decided these are things that I wanna add, made a checklist so that when I create my artwork, this is what I look at. And it's, it's intentional. Mm. I sit down and I go, okay, did I it push the caricature enough in this? And if I didn't, I try to do that a little bit more. Did I, was I intentional with my color? Did I make sure I, you know, I just have this and I'll, I'll drop this in the, um, the file folder for you guys too, but we're over time. So I just want to make sure you guys saw that. And um, any uh, real quick feedback. How'd you guys, what'd you guys think of today? Did you learn something new? Was it like a fire hose? It was fabulous. Very good. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and do you have a list of what we're going to be doing each each week? Yes. I will create that and give that to you guys. And put that okay. in the folder as well. Good. I'm so glad you learned some new stuff, Chloe. Glad you learned a lot too, Marie. Thank you so much. All right. You guys are wonderful. So glad that you were here with me today. Um, if you can, come on to the Chantel and Bergen Thorn um, speaker tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. I'm going to um, drop or send that link out again. And yeah. um, I'll email you guys the link again to um, the Google file drive and um, upload everything else. And if I'll, I'll stay behind for like for another minute or two, if you guys have any questions, I'll stay behind to answer them. But other than that, your time with me is complete. Beautiful to see you. I look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow morning and again next week. Oh, and then, sorry, one last thing. Friday. Fridays are my open studio sessions. You all have access to that. Um, you have information on when that's at. That is a different Zoom link, okay? So if you want to come and bring your work that you were working on for homework today, you can bring that Friday, okay? Otherwise, bye have everyone. a wonderful day. Thank bye. you, Marissa. Bye, Mira. Thank you so much. Bye, Lori. And the homework will be due next class, ideally. Yes, yes. Homework but also homework. remember everyone, you're not getting a grade for this class. So don't put too much pressure on yourself. Do your best yeah. and your best is all we can ask for. Yeah. When do we, when is the uh, work due to put into the, um, you know, where we submit? Is oh, it for Sunday? the open studio session? Yeah. No, you I can... mean for Monday's, uh, for next week's class. Oh. oh, try to upload by, I would say ideally would be Monday. Yeah. Monday. Sorry, okay. Talk about that. Monday. Yeah. That yeah. yeah. Tuesday, yeah. Class, I'll, right. I'll write that in the email too. Oh, okay. yeah. Right, please write that in the email because that will give us enough time to critique. And if you upload something afterwards, I mean, I try to do any last minute critiques during class, like people who might've like uploaded late, but I typically don't go back to that folder after that class is finished. You are welcome to DM me on Discord, anybody, um, if you need additional help or want additional feedback, if you didn't like submit something. Um, but yeah, the best way to get feedback is sending it on Monday, the day before the class, even if it's the night before that's better. Cause it gives us some time Tuesday morning to be able yeah. to give you feedback. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for asking that Mark. Thank you. All right. Do you guys have any questions? No, it's so good that you're here, Lori. So glad you're here. I know how well I love seeing everybody that I remembered their names from before. I know, least. isn't that fantastic? Yeah. And I'm so glad Thanks. you're here, Kevin. Me too. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't find my unmute. <laughs> <laughs> so Lori, you know, Lori was in my class, uh, a very small class with me when I was with Kat, with Dave, with Dave's school. Oh, awesome. So you did an animation class. Yeah, it was just basically like the fundamentals of like animation stuff. So we, yeah. Just, I wish I took that class in hindsight. I'm sad that they're not teaching it in their own studio anymore, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, you're good. You know lots. I, but I've never animated, like truly animated before. So really? Yeah, because I was an entertainment design kid. That's, oh. why, that's why I never had you in school. Oh, that's but right. That was one of my big regrets was not taking animation don't have any regrets you are so okay okay great <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you kevin did you have something you're just still here he's just hanging okay all right well thank all you right. for being here Lori. are you what are you looking forward to in this class the most 
I think just at our last class, you just started touching on color and harmonizing, you know, them. So, and yeah. composition, I, yeah. That's gonna be fun. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited <laughs> to do that for you guys too. Yeah, so I got a lot of homework to do. Yeah. Gotta go. Yeah, but it'll be fun. <laughs> right? I know it is, it is gonna be a lot. I'm gonna do it too, Larissa. Okay, good. Yeah, I have to do it too. All right. All, All right, right we guys. see you next week. Thank you, Lori. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, bye, Larissa. I'll talk to you later. Okay, have a good night. You too, bye. Bye.